without any further ado, uh, Mr. Teo Roxon here is uh, a speaker and consultant and media personality who runs UYD Management, a strategic leadership and consulting firm that helps organizations incorporate sustainable diversity and inclusion practices. He hosts the number one cross-cultural podcast in the world, and his podcast was recently ranked as number two business podcast in the world by entrepreneur and CIO. He has spoken at TEDx multiple times, the World Bank, and the United Nations Foundation, among many other places. He was recently named a top millennial influencer to watch in 2018 by New Theory Magazine, and his Art of Diplomacy TED Talk was called one of the 11 TED Talks that will make you a better entrepreneur by 99designs. Please welcome Mr. Teo Roxon. Teo. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, first of all, I want to thank Sarah Christine for introducing me and um, saying all those words. I can't imagine how much that was. And um, I want to thank you all for coming here. So today we have a very, very big mission. We've been tasked with the idea of what the youth will be like today and what it would be like tomorrow. And I, I hearken back to a time uh, when I was born, really. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Nigerian, and I was born in two military dictatorships. So the first nine years of my life, I've always thought about leadership, but my initial example of that was what you normally see as the hallmarks of a dictatorship, which is suppression of opponents, muzzling of the press, and um, sometimes violations of human rights. And in addition to this, as my dad's job started to take us to different parts of the world, I began to ask myself this question. Why do we live in a globalized time in a digitalized time and still have problems communicating across cultures. And as I asked myself this question, I, I also began to feel the effects of what it was like to be in between different cultures, how your perception sometimes can be made for you without people getting to know you. And I look at today's time, I look at what's going on in different parts of the world, regardless of opinions you may have, it's very clear that for any one of us to be better leaders, we do essentially need to understand what it takes to effectively connect across cultures. How do we deal with the nuance that is the world? We, I often say we, we are governed by binary systems, but we, in reality, we are all nuanced. We're never just one thing. We are many things at the same time. You know, there's an intersectionalism that exists between that. And so with that in mind, I'd like to present to you three different ways that we can possibly navigate these uh, cultural differences. And they are as follows. One is to educate, two is to make sure you don't perpetuate, and three is to make sure that instead of that, you communicate. So educate, don't perpetuate, instead communicate. So what exactly is education? To me, education involves a few things. It's IQ, it's EQ, and it's CQ. And for those listening, IQ is intelligence quotient, EQ is emotional intelligence, and CQ is cultural intelligence. And essentially with education, you're looking at it at a multi-layered point of view. You're looking at it from an education of self and an education of environment. Uh, education of self is everything in life. Everyone has to start with themselves. You have to have an idea of who you are. But a big element of also education of self when you're looking at the global landscape and looking at leadership is understanding what your biases are. Every one of us has biases. We all have them. We all have preferences and we all have decisions that we make based on these preferences. But many of us refuse to acknowledge them because we feel like that makes us racist, bigoted, or you know, potentially uh, vile members of the society. But this is something that has existed since we were born. This is how we realize that we're not supposed to walk in front of a lion when it's, when it's right in front of you or walk in front of certain things. And our brain takes all these shortcuts and processes them as learned behavior. And so how do we make sure that as we are educating ourselves on our biases, we're making sure we're exposing ourselves to different things so our brains can actually um, understand them? Well, like I said, it's by acknowledging your biases. The first thing you can do, or first three questions you can ask during this moment is, one, you know, who are your three best friends? Where are the uh, last three neighborhoods you've lived in? And who are the last three people you've been in relationships with? Now, some of you might not have been in relationships, and that's okay. But a lot of times when you... <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of times, though, when you think about these decisions, it's, it's 
we we go through life making a lot of decisions without actually knowing why we make them. You know, sometimes I've, I go around speaking almost every week and I ask a lot of people, spe specifically the youth, hey, why do you think this way? And they're like, I don't know, my parents told me, or it's just the way it is. And this thing, this habit of not understanding why we think a certain way about a certain group of people or a certain group of, um, you know, you know, uh, I guess a certain culture is very dangerous if we're not able to articulate that. And what we're doing is promoting this idea of um, debate just to debate and not debate for critical thinking. And so understand what your biases are. Biases inform every single decision that you make today. Who you hire, who you fire, what you promote on TV, and who you surround yourself with. And so that's, that's one part of the um, education of self. Another element of education of self is also to, to look at what you do to put yourself as the minority everywhere you go. I was in a position because of my dad's job where I didn't have a choice uh, about where I was. I was in five countries and four continents by the time I was 18. So, it, you know, it didn't matter. I couldn't tell dad and like, I can't move. I was always the only this, the only that. But I encourage all of us to do that on purpose. On a weekly basis, how many times are you putting yourself in a position where you are the minority? And the reason why we need to do that is if we are going to live amongst ourselves, and we have no choice, we do have to understand what it's like for another person to see uh, their world through our, our lens and us to see the world through their lens. That's where empathy is formed. And so that's education of self. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second part of education is education of your environment. Now, I said earlier, my dad was a diplomat. And because of all these moving around, I used to observe my dad as a, as a young boy, old as a three, and being told in Nigeria that you are the, essentially the the one everyone is watching, including your extended family. I try to watch the next male person I could see, and that was my dad. And with every move, I observed as he sought to take in his environment and maintain relationships with people internationally and locally. And I would look at him. I, I would just look at him and, and watch what he would do. And um, back then, uh, his habits included, he would go through a newspaper and, oh, forgot there are many people under 25 here so a newspaper is a l printed publication which is loosely held paper and usually holds the news but <laughs> he would go through the newspaper from front to back and then um he would uh turn on the news bbc cnn local news station and i asked him dad why do you do these things why why are you always so routine like this and he said you know he looked at me and he said i can tell you the world is bigger than you and if you want to succeed in it, you have to understand it. The world is bigger than you, and if you want to succeed in it, you have to understand it. What I learned from him about education of the environment is that first thing you can do is to observe, learn how to observe and gather information. Second thing you can do is to be uh, an effective listener, an active listener rather, and the last thing you can do is to be an active member of your community. So how do you collect and gather information? Many of times when you've become aware of your biases, it's by learning and saying, okay, I understand that I'm uncomfortable with this. And I'm, I, I don't understand these people or these, this religion or that. So what can I do to educate myself about that environment? So how can you collect and gather information? Is it through podcasts, through videos, through putting yourself in a situation where you're the minority? And what are you learning? What are the trends? And then once you've done that, the next thing is to become an active listener. So active listening is listen to learn, listen to understand, and listen to evaluate. So how can you put yourself in a position where you are actively listening and not asking those questions that only confirm your beliefs? Another way you can be an active listener is to ask open-ended questions. And so not those leading questions that say, that person is such a despicable person, right? No, it's what do you think about that person? What comes to mind when someone says something like that? How do we do that? So learn how to collect and gather information, become an active listener. And the last thing is to embed yourself in the community. If I were to ask you all, what is the current socioeconomic makeup of your current um, um, domicile, your, the way you live? How many of you can tell me who the mayor is, what the religion is, and who lives next door? This is, uh, okay, one, okay. This is not an indictment, but this is something that we all, the fact that we go through life without knowing this, it's something that happens because when elections come, everybody says, I didn't realize that that person next to me has this belief or has this because we don't actually take more time to understand that environment. So education of environment. Now moving on to don't perpetuate. I remember when I first came to the States, many of you can probably recognize from my voice that I'm going to I'm, an, uh, <laughs> I'm a Nigerian with a seemingly American accent, so I used to have arguments with people 
about uh, the fact that I was Nigerian. It's the only passport I hold. I currently hold, and I haven't held any since. People used to sing um, Lion King songs and throw darts at me because they were like, yo, that's the only representation of Africa we have. When you're not, <laughs> and these things were seemingly jokes, but the fact that people can make those jokes at the expense of other people's identity is something that's dangerous. A lot of times what we promote on TV and call PC is, is that we are limiting other people. And how many times in our dialogues are we limiting other people? Members of your own community. So make sure that in your perpetuation, you're not saying and participating in jokes that can limit other people's identity. And the other thing is the news you spread. There's a whole industry built on clickbait news, and a lot of people call it fake news. Google had to ban 200 members, 200 sites from their AdSense network so that they could actually deal with the algorithms. So how are you making sure that you're not just sharing news based on the headline and you're actually looking at the news that you're sharing? Are you looking at the URL? Are you verifying the sources before you share? Many of us are too quick to hit share, share, share. See, 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 this is what that said. And what we're doing is we're creating insider and outsider dynamics. Insider dynamics, insiders are the ones that are you know, unwittingly uh, unaware of what's going on because the system seems to affect, um, doesn't seem to affect them and outsiders participate in the, in, the, in the system that seemingly is against them. And so you have this inside and outside of dynamic. And so we have to make sure that we're being more inclusive with that. If you're part of the problem, remember, you can also be part of the solution. And the last thing is to don't is to communicate. And um, communicating is, is all about understanding how to communicate with people that have different values from you. These are people that you may share um, an office space with or a school environment with, and they may have a different religion from you. And you might say, I can't possibly share a room with you because you believe this. And the first thing I always encourage people to do is to learn how to understand that there are 7.5 billion people in the world, and that means everybody has different filters. And so if you let go of your need to be right and the idea that your perspective is the only perspective, you can start to let go of your ego, which leads to more openness and more possibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two reasons why people don't believe that they can change the world, and that's because of fixed mindsets and limited worldviews. People with fixed mindsets seek to validate themselves, and people with growth mindsets seek to develop themselves. But the world, the work to change the world does not end at the offices of law enforcement or governments. It begins with us, in our backyards, in our schools, and in our minds. And so, the choice ultimately lies with us and the decisions we make in private and in public. If you all, determined individuals here, are, are intent on being your, um, you know, uh, custodians of the world and world citizens, I always ask everyone one question, and that is, will you be willing to use your differences to make a difference? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the insight on educating self and building cross-cultural relationships to promote change.